Hello and welcome to today's meeting of IWF Reads Author Chats. Today we will be discussing Mom Jeans by Abigail Tucker. Before we welcome Abby, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Hadley Manning. I am Policy Director at Independent Women's Forum. And uh, I read Mom Jeans on my Kindle app on my phone. And this is what it looks like. I encourage you all, if you haven't read it yet, to grab your own copy. I think I've recommended this book to more people than I've ever recommended any book before. I'm a big fan. So again, before I welcome Abby, I've got some sort of um, background information, uh, some tips for those of you who might be joining us for a book club event for the first time. Um, I wanna let you know that on the right side of our screen, we have a chat room. That's where you can join the discussion and um, you can um, see that many of my IWF teammates are in there. We will have a T next to our names if we are IWF women's. If you are not seeing the chat room, just select the arrow in the top right corner to open the chat window. Next to the chat room tab, there is a questions tab. If you have a question for Abby or for me, just post it in the questions tab and you can give other attendees questions a a bump by hitting the up arrow. So that'll help me find the best questions fastest. Um, and then towards the end of our time today, we're going to be doing a drawing. We're gonna draw three names to win signed copies of Abby's book. If you wanna win, you have to be present during the drawing at the end of today's event. So the books um, will be mailed to you um, if you're a door prize winner. So stick around until the very end. Now that we have that housekeeping out of the way, I wanna to get to the main event right away. It's my pleasure to introduce Abby Tucker. Abigail Tucker's work has been featured in the Best American Science and Nature Writing Series. She is the New York Times bestselling author of The Lion in the Living Room, How House Cats Tamed Us and Took Over the World. Uh, she's been named a best, uh, uh, this book, The Lion in the Living Room, has been named a best science book of 2016 by Library Journal and Forbes and has now been translated into 13 languages. A correspondent for Smithsonian Magazine, she lives in New Haven, Connecticut with her husband and four equally amazing children. Um, so welcome, Abby. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Hadley. I'm really looking forward to this. Of course. Well, I've got some prepared questions, but as I mentioned to our group before, we also have the questions tab. So I encourage people in our audience to submit their own questions. Um, I want to start out by sharing a little bit about how I read this book. I, I mentioned I read it on my Kindle app. I read it while I was uh, nursing a newborn baby over this spring and the summer. And uh, it really hit home. I also want to thank Abby for writing the book because I would say overwhelmingly the feeling I felt as a mom reading this book was one of validation. I felt really validated by the book. I felt like my transformation and what the experience that I was having as a mom was real and it was so much bigger than maybe how I had understood motherhood just as a social construct as a child. You know, I was told I was gonna do many jobs in my life, but motherhood didn't feel like just another job to me. It felt like a really big deal. And if you read the book, you find out motherhood really is a really big deal. So um, I want to start out maybe by asking you, um, from your perspective, there are so many amazing tidbits in the book about what fetal stem cells can do, about what moms can do, about what other mammalian moms do. And some of the research findings are just so cool as anecdotes and as little pieces of information. So. What are one or two of those tidbits from the book that you thought were most notable or interesting or memorable for you? Oh my gosh, you're, you're so right, Hadley. And thank you so much for having me to talk about this stuff. Um, and I'm glad that it sort of um, shed light on your own experience because I've sort of come to understand um, motherhood um, and the maternal transformation as sort of like um, a stage of adult development and actually kind of like the most profound and jarring stage of a development that human adults do go through. Um, so that's sort of the big picture, this idea that even though sort of like the brain is not the first organ that you think of when you head through those labor and delivery doors, it's this actual key player in um, the maternal um, birth, basically. Um, so there were so many tidbits, so many that I came across when I was um, researching the book. Um, you know, everything from the microchimerism stuff that you mentioned, which is this phenomenon where um, scientists are studying how the uh, cells of the fetus um, travel across the placenta into the mother's body and integrate with the tissues of her um, flesh, everything from her liver to her kidney, to her heart, and even to her brain. Um, scientists are still trying to figure out 
what all these alien little cells um, are doing inside of your body, but they've got some interesting theses and, you know, they can protect us from certain diseases. They can help us heal wounds. Um, and, you know, even though maybe you gave birth to a baby 70 years ago, the cells of that baby are still inside of your body doing stuff. Um, I loved learning about that. Um, you know, the research spans as wide as, you know, there's um, uh, livestock breeders that are trying to use genetics to develop animal super moms. I kind of thought that was amazing and just such a novel idea that even just the sheer idea that across the world, there's laboratories with super smart scientists who are studying the manufacture of mothers and who actually can take a rat and, you know, treat it in particular ways and trigger its maternal impulses. I, that was just sort of news to me that I could go and in fact volunteer for experiments and study my own brain, um, which I, I loved as well. So, um, you know, I could go on and on about the differences between uh, carrying a male fetus versus a female fetus. But, you know, we should, well, let's go back to your questions before I get too crazy. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I definitely felt like when my first child was born, it was a girl and I felt like I gave birth and then I felt like my heart had come out of my body. <laughs> no, but it turns out when I'm reading this book, like actually maybe some of her cells are in my heart, you know, so that's pretty <laughs> backwards and exciting. But um, after I took this baby home, I then immediately recognized that as much as I loved her, I really didn't know what I was doing about a lot of things. And I felt kind of disappointed because I was like, maternal instinct, let's go. Like I should know how to do things. So I really enjoyed the discussion in the book about maternal instinct in humans. So please tell me, am I supposed to have this maternal instinct? Am I a failure if I feel like I don't have a good one? Um, just tell our audience a little about, about how that works and what it means to have a maternal instinct. So the maternal instinct is something that you definitely do have, you know, you just described it. It's this um, newfound uh, sensitivity to and responsiveness to um, infant cues and this sudden sort of rekindling of your systems of desire and reward so that suddenly that this person who you didn't really know existed before becomes your kind of sun, moon and stars. Um, the the idea, this lost idea that you're talking about, which I totally relate to when you come home from the hospital and the nice, friendly night nurse is gone and you're all, you know, maybe your husband has to take a call and you're all left all alone by yourself. Um, you don't know what to do with the baby. That is more what scientists call our lack of a fixed action pattern. So a lot of mam simpler mammalian mothers just kind of like have almost like a checklist of things that they do with their babies. And, you know, for the, for example, the mother rat, you know, a few days before her, I mean, mother rabbit, before her baby is born, she starts pulling the fur out of her chest and thighs and making a nest. And if you don't let her do this, then her mothering behaviors are gonna be disrupted. Humans have this much more various um, array of maternal behaviors, which is something that makes us super interesting, but kind of hard to understand. Um, there's, you know, even when you talk about something as, which seems instinctive to a lot of us, like mother ease, the sort of cutesy way that we talk to our babies, um, there's cultures in the world where mother ease doesn't really exist. Um, and so when you get down to it, one of the very few things that's like a strong pattern among new mothers is that we tend to cradle our babies on the left sides of our bodies, which fascinated me because I'd always had this tendency to do this. And my husband is a right cradler. And we'd sort of had these debates about, you know, which is better and what makes more sense. But it turns out that all of our theories were wrong. And the reason that, you know, moms kind of instinctively cradle on the left is that, you know, our brains have a lopsided um, layout and it sort of is the most efficient way to exchange social information with the right hemisphere of our, of our brains. Um, and it turns out that if you look across all mammals, um, like mom walruses like to swim with their babies on the left and mom fruit bats like to like hang upside down with their babies on the left. This is like a, a common thing, but that only gets you so far, <laughs> the left cradling. So it's more, the study of maternal behavior is less about the study of a specific behavior. It's about this underlying motive, which is what drives us. Yeah, I feel like I totally relate to like the infant crying is like 
nails on a chalkboard. Like I'm like, oh, I yeah. must, I must respond. Like it's an alarm. <laughs> it's an alarm going off in my brain. But I also appreciate the discussion of the left cradling more now that I understand that it was just to settle a big marital debate in your household. So take that, <laughs> okay. Abby's husband, you were wrong. Left so is wrong. better. <laughs> no, I always thought that I cradled on the left side because I'm right-handed. And exactly. I thought I want to keep my right hand free so I can do all the things. But no. left-handed left women also are prone to cradle um, on the left. And they're actually, you know, and of course, I I would have the, the few friends who, who cradle on the right. And so I don't want to, you know, upset anybody out there. But this is just something, a pattern that scientists have studied. And actually, you know, one of my favorite things about um, this uh, research is how researchers will use tools and sort of like the random junk lying around our houses to kind of make sense of our behaviors. And so one way that they were able to tabulate these um, left-sided cradling biases was they went through a bunch of mother's photo albums and kind of looked mm -hmm. at the sides that they were cradling the babies on and, um, you know, made uh, their... Um, their research work that way, which I thought was fascinating. Yeah, that's the first thing I did when I read that part of the book is I, I went through my phone pictures. I was like, am I a left side cradler? Like, I think I think that I am, but I am. I know, um, right? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, kind of a relief, but, you know, you can get by on the right side. You too. can totally get by. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, let's, um, my next question is kind of big one. And I'm cheating a little bit because it's a question that you say early in the book. I'm going to attempt to answer this question. And so we'll the question is, uh, how are moms different from people who aren't moms and similar to one another? So I know that's what the whole book is about, but if you had to sum it up, you know, how are sheep moms and mice moms and human moms similar and what makes us different from non-moms uh, or even maybe different from our pre-motherhood selves? Yeah, so we're similar enough, um, lucky for us, to... to um, to rodent moms, that rodent moms are stepping up for a lot of these experiments that you know really you can't do with human moms. Um, experiments where um, they're able to sort of like physically investigate the maternal brain and zero in on this area called the medial preoptic area, which um, we believe is the site, uh, the central site of maternal behavior um, to the extent that if you um, disable this area in a rat's brain, maternal behavior cease ceases, whereas um, with a lot of, um, you can do a lot of things to a female rat and her maternal drive is so strong that she is just not even going to waver. Um, so that is a lucky thing that this is, you know, this maternal instinct is ancient. Um, it is um, sort of our mammalian core. It's, you know, probably something that we can date back to our last common ancestor, you know, this animal that basically developed these key adaptations of internal gestation and um, lactation, which led to sort of the onus being on the mother in um, mammalian uh, parenting activities. Um, so uh, we can, uh, when it comes to human moms and the changes that we undergo that sort of separates us from other types of people on average, um, there's these experiments that uh, scientists do um, that use um, mach uh, machines like um, MRIs and fMRIs to see how moms um, from pregnancy, uh, pre-pregnancy, through pregnancy to post-pregnancy undergo certain physical changes um, in parts of our brain involving uh, social processing. There was an interesting study that came out a few years ago that showed that moms undergone, underwent um, a loss of gray matter in these certain key areas. And, you know, that sounds really depressing, but it's not like a deficit loss necessarily. It could be like a neural pruning or an um, efficiency enhancing kind of development that goes on. So our brains, if you look at them, pictures of them, our brains um, have common features that um, machine learning algorithms can detect. Like you could give this machine a picture of a brain and the machine will say, okay, that's a mom. Um, then there's also these functional differences. So if you show um, mothers uh, pictures of um, babies or other um, uh, infant cue related things, like let have them listen to the sound of cries, that nails on the chalkboard thing, um, our brains respond in slightly different ways on average than um, than other people's do. We might have sharper responses in certain areas of the brain. We might recruit slightly different parts of the brain. Um, and then on top of that, so that's the, the structure, the function. And then of course, there's these classic behaviors that we see in moms um, across humans and then also different kinds of um, 
mammals, uh, most notable, most famously, perhaps like maternal aggression, which is also called lactational aggression, which is this idea that, you know, these chemicals of childbirth and pregnancy and lactation have catalyzed these changes in our brain tissue that cause us to act um, differently than we might otherwise um, in stressful situations. So there's a ton of different commonalities across moms, and this is all to scientists' benefits because we can use a bunch of um, lab, um, uh, lab animals, especially rats and sheep, to understand ourselves. Yes, I'm glad that no one's physically investigating my mom brain. <laughs> That's a nice way of saying like cracking it open, <laughs> peeking around. Pretty much. Um, but I also really, I like the, the point about lactational aggression and there was one quote in the book that it's gotta be like on Kindle, it's gotta be one of the most widely shared. And it's like, after love, the most commonly cited emotion related to motherhood, and I'm I'm butchering it, you're, you're a much better writer than I am a speaker, but uh, is range. <laughs> So that's about it. <laughs> if you see uh, in the in the poll questions, guys, I've given our, our audience a chance to answer what feelings do you associate most with motherhood? And of course, 70% of you are saying love and empathy. Two percent or two uh, respondents, 29% say roller coaster of emotion. And then we have uh, rage and protectiveness. I gave that, I offered that, but it, it can't, it's hard to compete with love. But it's a it's yeah. a big it's a big deal. It's I do feel deal. especially when I'm sleep deprived. <laughs> I will be filled with rage, especially, okay, I made the mistake this time with our uh, latest baby of positioning my nursing chair so that I face our bed and I'd be nursing the baby and my husband would be asleep and I would just be filled with rage. Festering rage, oh yeah. <laughs> so watch out for that uh, maternal rage. My uh, next question is also kind of a, a cheating question because this is something else that you um, said at the outset of the book that you wanted to explore. And that was about, um, you know, if if we're all if we all have some things in common as mothers, if we undergo some of these neurological changes, um, then whoa, look at moms! Uh, they are so diverse. There's really not a cookie cutter mom. Um, you allude to the mommy wars, and my favorite of those is the um, colorful magnetile moms versus the clear magnetile. <laughs> I have colorful <laughs> magnetiles at my house. Um, but we at IWF, seriously, we stress often that there are no, there's no cookie cutter woman. There's no cookie cutter mom. Women are not a voting block. We have all different kinds of individual circumstances and beliefs and choice and preferences and dreams and so forth. So what did you find in writing this book um, about the diversity of human moms and our different approaches to motherhood? So actually, you know, as interested, and I really am interested in how, you know, I share certain attributes with like a hamster or a whale or any other kind of weird mammalian uh, entity there is out there. I'm kind of almost more interested in, you know, the differences that, that we see, the staggering differences that we see um, among mothers and not just like a mother in America versus one in the Netherlands or in China, but even just like you and your childhood best friend or the lady who you saw at the playground or the lady down the street. And so the second half of the book is an exploration of some of these variables that give rise to these um, differences in maternal behavior. And I, you know, I can only name a few things. They are so, um, some of them are so surprising, but they can go from simple things to like your age at first childbirth to, um, you know, whether or not you had a C-section, to whether you had a boy or a girl, to your lifelong exposure to plastics, to your genetic predisposition, to your relationship with your mother, to, you know, the culture that you live in, to, you know, your... Um, your your diet, your stress levels, your social network, all of these things um, shape every mother into the woman that she is. And just like, you know, no two babies are alike, um, no two moms are alike. And in fact, I believe that each one of us can become several different mothers over the course of our lifetime as our circumstances change. Um, just the idea of a child as wild card, like the way that we are shaped by the particular kid that we are given. This is something that you as a mom of three, Hadley, and as a mom of four, I think we can see like you are um, shaped by characteristics of your kid from their activity level to their, um, you know, to their personality, to, you know, the way they look, all kinds of things that 
um, change you subtly without you knowing it. But there's, you know, a whole labs that are just focused on, you know, your lifelong exposure to plastics and how they might that might interfere with your maternal behavior. My favorite stuff is the stress stuff and the social network stuff, because I feel like that stuff that we can um, influence uh, more in each other's lives and kind of help out other women. Totally. Um, we have a couple of really good questions coming up in the questions tab. So I wanna get to some of our audience questions. Uh, we have one from Allison. Uh, hi, Allison, thanks for joining us today. Um, she says, uh, jokingly, she says, how did you write a book with four children? Which is something that Abby and I actually discussed uh, before going live today. Uh, Allison says, I'm kidding, but truly, good job. And then she says, real question. How would you like your research to be used in helping new moms or moms-to-be? And maybe you just started to allude to that with some of the social support stuff. But Allison continues, uh, what are some ways that you've seen it shared to help them feel validated, as I said earlier? Yes. Um, so I do think that this is actually the, the key gist of what I was hoping to get across in the book. The fact that the maternal instinct is real, it's measurable, you can study it in a lab, you can see it on a brain scan, um, the way that we change um, physically in um, the course of becoming mothers. But that doesn't mean that this whole process is like set in stone and that mother nature is just going to take her course and we're all going to come out on the other side of this is like perfect little Stepford wife, automaton mothers who know what to do. Um, we are constantly being shaped by the world around us. And um, if you have a woman who is under a lot of um, social or economic stress, um, she is going to, her maternal behaviors are going to um, reflect that. And um, that's one of the things that, that sort of separates us from the, the whales and the hamsters that we as human women have collective control over our environment. And um, there's um, research in other countries and ideas in other countries that show ways that we can kind of use our smarts to um, give new moms the support that they need. Um, one of my favorite things is that in the Netherlands, each mother um, gets basically a free baby nurse to come home with her for like two weeks after her baby is born and show her the ropes of parenting, but also kind of make her dinner and just make her feel secure because that's the way that we are kind of um, built. We're as, as mammals built to sort of read the cues of our environment and to see, you know, are, are we giving birth in a um, time of um, feast or famine? Or is this a time of war or peace? You know, how safe am I and how safe is my child? And unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of women who do give birth in really hard circumstances. And given the opportunity, we should do things like, you know, give them um, free, free nursing support. Um, we can give them uh, free diapers. That's like, you know, lack of access to diapers is something that correlates with depression in new mothers. Um, we can, uh, like uh, in Australia, um, new moms have the opportunity if they're having trouble with getting their babies to sleep, there's, there's special hospitals where you can actually check yourself back into the hospital with your baby and they'll teach you how to do it because wow. for some of us it's taken like, you know, three or four pregnancies right, to figure right. this out. So yeah. there's well, so many different things. So speaking of this feast or famine, and uh, this will have to be our last question because we're, we're running low on time, but uh, the COVID pandemic, kind of a famine time uh, yes. for a lot of people. So uh, Victoria asks, what are the biggest challenges that moms have faced um, due to or during the COVID-19 pandemic? A lot of changes, even the experience of giving birth with masks or lack of family, loved ones, etc. What would you say about the impact of the pandemic on motherhood uh, sort of broadly and on moms? Exactly. I, I think that um, in a way the pandemic has shown, you know, I think it's surprised a lot of people how much moms as opposed to their partners were taking this um, whole experience kind of on the nose and how moms lost their jobs at much higher rates um, and, you know, experienced high levels of depression. Um, and I think that, you know, the pandemic just kind of showed us how important the social fabric of our lives is to creating a healthy maternal experience. And, 
even if something as simple as, you know, having an office where you go in and you see other people and you feel that you're sort of valued and seen, that can be really important for new moms who choose to go back to work. Um, being uh, the idea of people being isolated from their grandparents was particularly um, hideous, I think, for a lot of new moms, because we are in a way built through this adapt this miraculous adaptation of menopause that I learned about um, to have this kind of like right hand grandma who's supposed to be helping you out if she if she's able to um, and new moms who became moms during this time haven't had that and so I think it's just kind of shown us how um, powerful we are um, in each other's lives I love that I think that's a, a really good sort of call to action to those of us who can be supportive of other moms um, I have an announcement um, before we hear final thoughts from Abby I want to be sure we get to our drawing winners for our signed book door prize. So the winners are Teresa Limbry, Lynn Ferrero, and April Smalley. So again, Teresa Limbry, Lynn Ferrero, and April Smalley, thank you guys for joining us. You guys will be getting signed copies of Mom Jeans by Abigail Tucker. We'll send those to you in the mail. Um, Abby, I, I do want to give you a chance just to give us some sort of final thoughts. If there's anything that uh, I haven't asked you about, I, I always come to these conversations with tons more questions than we have time for, but um, I'll give you the floor and you just share what you think is most important or best takeaway. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I feel lucky that a lot of women in your audience are interested in politics and, uh, and involved. And I just think that there's so much we can learn about this research about how culture shapes mothering. And there have been fascinating studies comparing American babies to babies in the Netherlands, showing how our babies are a lot sort of um, harder to soothe and more, um, more to use the word depressed is not right, but they're just sort of tougher babies than these babies in the Netherlands. And part of that, scientists believe, is because their mothers are in a situation where they're kind of more likely to be um, depressed. And the, the reasons for this um, American depression and maternal depression phenomenon can range, you know, some of the key underlying causes are stuff like um, income inequality and women who are forced to work swing shifts and more than 40 hours a week. But I just think that, you know, we should think of mothers not as just these sort of battle axes who are built to um, beat all the odds, but as sensitive beings who are constantly reading the cues from their environments. And we are the ones who give each other the cues. So that's something that I, I think that we should all think about, whether it's crafting policy stuff to, you know, just your friend down the street had a COVID baby. And, you know, instead of making her one dinner, you make her five dinners because that shows that you see her and you care for her. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. I guess we all live in our own microcosms because I've read that COVID has caused this big baby bust. And right. yet, and yet I'm cooking like <laughs> casserole after casserole after casserole yeah. because my friends are having lots of babies. And I guess maybe it's just depending on where you live and who you're friends with. But I feel like my casserole dishes have been really busy lately. So but I'm I'm just repaying people who did yeah, it for that. me, which is a great it's a great tradition. And I think it's just one of many things like you mentioned that we can do to show support to new moms. And and I also agree that the public policy discussion is very important. That's what we spend a lot of time doing at IWF. Um, so thank you, Abby. Um, we're so glad that um, you could share with us. I um, I really enjoyed reading the book. As I mentioned, I, I want to get like a 10 pack or 20 pack of the book so I can give them out to all my mom friends for Christmas. Um, but uh, I also want to encourage people in our audience um, to join the IWF Reads Book Club Facebook group. It's a private group. It's called IWF Reads Book Club. So find us on Facebook and that way you'll find out about future events with wonderful authors like Abby. I also want to tell our audience a little bit about Independent Women's Forum in case they're not familiar. IWF is the leading national women's organization dedicated to developing and advancing policies that enhance people's freedom, choices, and well-being. Uh, we have an amazing staff of all women. I'm on the staff. I'm proud to be uh, on the staff with uh, some of the sharpest policy, communications, and legal minds in the country. We testify before Congress and state legislatures. We produce educational materials and publish articles about various policy issues. We file legal briefs in various court cases, and we frequently interface with the media to make the case for better public policy. Um, we also make it a point to champion women from across the country to celebrate their accomplishments and lives. If you haven't read our Champion Women Profile series, I encourage you guys to do that. 
You can find that under um, our About tab on iwf.org. We release a new profile every two weeks. Um, and you can find all kinds of information and new daily content on iwf.org. Um, sign up to be an email subscriber or even a mobile insider, and that way you can get special text alerts from IWF with our latest news and updates and events. Um, I just want to say thanks again to everybody, especially Abby, uh, for joining us today. I really enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to our next IWF Reads event soon. So have a great rest of your week, everybody, and we hope to see you next time. Bye.